Okay, today we're going to do two chapters. We're going to do chapter 8 and chapter 9. Each one has to do with uh, the sensory process, uh, touch and pain, and then uh, the chemical uh, senses, uh, taste and smell. I think that's it. And hearing. Hearing's going to be in there too. Okay, so let's go ahead and start with chapter 1. There we go. Or chapter 8, I'm sorry. <laughs> Chapter 8. Sensory receptor organs are present in all animal species and filter different energy information from the environment. These sensory receptor organs respond to some stimuli, but not others. Sensory receptor organs convert environmental energy into the language of the nervous system. Electrical signals. Now you have to think that, or you have to understand that we have all this information coming to us, and in order to survive, we need to be, we need to know what's in our environment. Uh, so we need to to smell what's in our environment. We need to hear what's in our environment. We need to see what's in our environment. Uh, we need to taste things that uh, are good for us and will feed us, and we need to taste things that will poison us. Uh, we need to know when to run away. We need to f be able to feel pain. We need to f be able to feel a lot of different things. And that's one of the reasons why uh, we have all of this information coming into us at, at, at any one time. Normally, if I, were doing, if I were doing this lecture in the classroom, I would tell my students right now, you're sitting in the chair and you can feel... You can feel the curve of the chair, you can feel with your hands, you can feel your notebooks uh, that you're potentially writing in, uh, you can hear me talking, uh, potentially you can smell what you had for breakfast in your breath, uh, if you're breathing uh, with your mouth, um, all, you know, you, all, of the, all this information is coming in at, at one time and you're trying to detect uh, what's happening in your environment. Well, if there were danger in your environment, if I was a dangerous person and I was making noise and you could hear my voice uh, and you would uh, recognize my voice as uh, someone who is dangerous, uh, you might uh, try to stay away from me because of, of the sound. Uh, if you, uh, let's see, that's hearing. <laughs> if you see somebody that's, that's dangerous, somebody that's... Uh, that you want to stay away from, you know, that's, all of this has to do with, uh, with surviving in your environment. A sensory system requires different receptors to discriminate among forms of energy. A sensory system discriminates among different intensities of stimulation. A sensory system must respond in a reliable manner. A sensory system must respond rapidly. A sensory system must suppress extraneous information. We don't want information that's not there. <clears throat> we don't want to take in information that's, that's uh, not important. Uh, so if we're in a <clears throat> dangerous situation, we're walking in downtown Phoenix, and um, someone approaches us, and we see that they, they are somebody that's angry, uh, they've got an, a, a strange look on their face, uh, then we would know that 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 is important. If we see somebody walking beside them and they're smiling and laughing, and they uh, and they're a little small person that you don't really have to worry about, that's extraneous information. The the information that's important is uh, the individual that looks dangerous, and of course that's we have to we have to get rid of that extraneous information. If you're walking downtown Phoenix and you hear an explosion, but at the same time you're you're, you hear music coming out of a mu music store at the same time. The explosion is probably far more uh, important uh, than the music coming from the store. Or if you hear a car uh, screeching its, its tires right behind you, that's probably more important than what, the, uh, what your friend is saying right beside you. That's extraneous information. Okay. Stimuli that sensory uh, systems detect are either in the form of physical energy or chemical substances. Each sensory organ is designed to receive and transmit a specific type of stimuli to the brain. The receiving portion of the sensory organ is, is, is the receptor cell. The receptor cell converts the energy into an electrical potential. When a receptor cell changes the energy of its stimulus to a readable electrical or chemical potential, it is called sensory transduction. 
Thus, the receptor cells are known as transducers. Some receptor cells have axons uh, of their own, while others stimulate an associated nerve ending. The structure of a receptor determines the forms of energy to which it will respond. Uh, uh, receptor cells generate a potential as the change that must take place between the impact of the stimuli and the initiation of nerve impulses. Generator potential is represented by electrical charge. Generator potential, uh, you're walking, uh, you, uh, you have cookies in the oven, and you're two rooms away, and all of a sudden you smell, the, sm the, the cookies smell done. So you would want to uh, go and take them out of the, the oven. Uh, if you're, if you, you don't respond to uh, the smell of cookies being done, if you don't know what done cookies smell like, uh, you may wait until you actually smell smoke before you respond to uh, taking your cookies out of the uh, out of the oven, and of course then you have crisp, nice crisp, uh, burned uh, cookies, and that's not what you want. You want the, you want the cookies to be done. The skin contains various types of receptors. There are free nerve endings in the epidermis that detect pain and temperature. There are Merkel discs and Meissner's corpuscles just below the epidermis that detect touch. Uh, there are piscinian uh, corpuscles in the lowest level of the dermis that detect vibration. There are Ruffini's uh, endings in the same area that detect stretching. And we're going to explain all of this. And as you can see in uh, this diagram over here, these are all of the different nerve endings. Now, most of the, the nerve endings are in the dermis, in the uh, uh, second layer of the um, uh, of of your skin, you got a you got an outer covering, and then that's the epidermis, and then you have your dermis, which is the the second layer. Piscinian corpuscles are found throughout the body in skin cells and muscle fibers. They detect vibration. Piscinian corpuscles are onion shaped uh, structures that surround the axons of afferent uh, neurons. Vibrations produce an electrical potential whose level is directly proportional, proportional to the strength of the vibration. When the electrical impulse is strong enough, nerve impulse is generated. This is really kind of interesting. My wife and I, my wife was stationed in Japan, and I was, uh, I, I went with her to Japan. And Japan has a lot of uh, uh, earthquakes, and so... <laughs> Uh, we couldn't always detect what was going on. The interesting thing was, if you were sitting down, you had, you know, that whole surface of your of your derriere, your your butt, uh, sitting on a chair. A lot of times, you could feel the vibrations. But if you're standing on your feet, the number of piscinian corpuscles in your in your feet aren't aren't very great. But the ones in your in your uh, gluteus maximus and in, in the uh, in your uh, fanny. Is uh, there's much more there than uh, there are in your feet. So if you're sitting down, you could actually detect the earthquake, uh, no matter how how weak it was. And if you're standing up, even the strongest earthquake, unless it was shaking the house from side to side, you really couldn't tell that it was happening. Now the interesting thing is that uh, we had two cats there. And they could always tell when the earthquake was about to happen. They would always run away. They'd always run out of the house uh, to uh, uh, to protect themselves. And then as soon as the earthquake was done, they'd come back. Uh, they were a lot smarter than we were. Uh, and, of course, the cat's paws are um, far more sensitive to uh, to vibrations than, than our, our own feet. Of course, for one thing, we, had, uh, we were wearing uh, shoes. And uh, for that reason, we couldn't detect the earthquakes. Uh, this stimulus occurs because the vibration deforms the corpuscle. Uh, this de deformation uh, leads to the tip of the axon being mechanically stretched. Stretching the axon enlarges the pores in the membrane, allowing sodium ions to enter. When the generator potential reaches threshold amplitude, the axon produces one or more nerve impulses. Each receptor cell encodes the stimulus so that touch impulses will not register colors and pain will not register smells. But each receptor has a range of response potentials. 
but does not encompass the sensitivity that most sensory organs detect. Multiple nerve cells acting in a parallel manner give the individual a coded picture of the intensity of the stimulation. Many receptors show progressive loss of response when stimulation is maintained. This is known as adaptation. So if you hurt your finger, uh, if you get a splinter in your finger, at first it, it's really, it really hurts. And, but after uh, 20 or 30 seconds, uh, the pain isn't nearly as intense as it was before. And this is because you have adapted to the pain. Uh, you, your, your body is reacting to the pain, and one of the ways it does that is by adapting, <clears throat> making the pain go away so that you won't, uh, that, that won't be your only reaction. You'll be able to react in a, in a more positive manner than to just start uh, saying ouch and start crying. Now the interesting thing, as you say ouch and start crying, actually the pain goes away. And that's because your your body and your brain are dealing with the pain. Tonic receptors show little adaptation. Phasic receptors show a rapid decrease in frequency of nerve impulses. And that's the way it is. Each sensory mo modality uh, has a select pathway that it takes to its sensory area in the brain. This is known as the sensory modality sensory pathway. Each sensory neuron has a type and an intensity of stimulus that will lead to its firing. This is known as the sensory neuron's receptive field. The area of the brain where select sensory information is received is the primary sensory cortex, and each, uh, each different uh, uh, receptor has its own area of the brain that it, that it uh, affects. Humans average between 10 to 20 square feet of skin on their bodies. Uh, skin is made up of three different layers. Uh, the top layer is the epidermis. That is the outer layer, and it ranges in thickness. Um, if you are relatively young, then your uh, skin is of optimum thickness. As you get older, your epidermis becomes thinner and thinner and thinner until it's almost like tissue paper. Uh, if somebody has uh, diabetes, uh, their skin tends to get uh, kind of uh, thick. It, it thickens your skin. Um, part of that has to do with the fact that the skin's not really being taken care of very well because of the uh, uh, poor, poorer circulation of individuals uh, who, have, uh, who, have, who are diabetic. Uh, the second layer of skin is known as the dermis. Uh, it contains a network of nerve fibers, blood vessels, and connective tissue. Uh, specialized outgrowths originate in the dermis. In uh, humans, of course, that would be hair. Uh, in other creatures, it would be things like feathers, claws, hooves, and horns. All of it comes from the dermis. Now, if we're talking about, uh, let's say that uh, you go outside and it's the, it's the beginning of spring and you haven't been outside all all. Uh, for a long, for a while anyway, and you go out in the sun uh, and you get a sunburn. If you get a sunburn, it's probably a, a, a first degree uh, burn. Uh, it hurts, uh, it turns red, and maybe it'll flake off at the top layer of skin. Uh, that's a first degree burn. First degree burn is only affects the uh, epidermis, the outer layer of, uh, of skin. Uh, however, if it starts to blister, then it has gone into the dermis. That's a second degree burn. Uh, so when doctors look at you for your, and we did, had to do this in the service, uh, because if they damage their skin too much, of course, we'd have to take them off duty. Uh, so if they had a first degree burn, no big deal. That's just a sunburn. Uh, it will go away. Uh, that layer of skin will go away. It will eventually flake off and then they'll grow a second layer of skin. They will grow <laughs> they will grow their skin back, that's what I mean. But if it gets into the dermis, uh, that's a second degree burn and it will blister. And if it blisters, of course, then it's going to take longer for them to heal. It uh, could become infected. Uh, you know, all kinds of interesting things happen. But if, uh, if they burn themselves with a blowtorch or something, then it might burn through the first two layers of skin, and that would be a third-degree burn, and that goes all the way down to the subcutaneous tissue. 
subcutaneous tissue or fat cells that act as thermal insulators and cushion the organs from mechanical shock. Uh, normally, if somebody gets a third degree burn, it scars. It scars because the first two layers have been destroyed and it has to, to uh, repair that skin as, as best at, that it can. Uh, the best that your skin can do to repair that is to uh, create scar tissue and the scar tissue of course is inflexible. Skin is very, is very, very flexible but scar tissue isn't flexible at all. And that's mainly the, as armor plating as it were, kind of. When a Pacinian corpuscle passes over a paper surface, the vibrations detected by the Pacinian corpuscles informs the individual of the texture of the paper. Only vibrating stimuli of more than 200 hertz will pass through the corpuscle and stretch the nerve fiber to reach its threshold. Pacinian corpuscles tend to be fast responding and fast adapting receptors. Meisner's corpuscles are touch sensitive and have a larger receptor field. They are fairly numerous. Meisner's corpuscles respond to change in stimuli. They fire rapidly and adapt quickly. They detect localized movement. They are more generalized uh, touch receptors than Merkel's discs. Merkel's discs are less numerous than Meisner's corpuscles and provide more sensitive information. Merkel's discs are slow adapting, so they give accurate information of what the individual is touching over time. Merkel's discs also have a small receptor field, which gives them greater sensitivity to spatial solution resolution. Ruffini's uh, endings respond to stretching. They respond when the skin is stretched. These receptors are slow adapting, and so they can give a more prolonged response to the stretching. However, due to the general information of stretching, they tend not to give a very complete representation of the form. Uh, so if you touch something, and this is one of the reasons why uh, if, you're, if you can't see something and you touch it, you're not exactly sure what it is. You kind of feel around and try, try to determine what it is uh, when, you, when you touch it. Um, it, you know, it's, it. It just gives you general information. Nerve fibers from the skin's surface run to the spinal cord. Somatosensory impulses are transported to the brain along two major pathways, the dorsal column system and the anterolateral system. The dorsal column system ascends to the medulla, which is uh, at the base of your brain stem. The anterolateral system crosses the spinal column and ascends to the thalamic region of the brain. Remember, the thalamus is in the middle of the brain. It's above the medulla. Uh, this system seems to mediate pain and temperature sensations. Some people are born with a genetic flaw that makes them insensitive to pain. These uh, individuals are able to feel, but they do not register pain. Many of them die young from trauma that the individual did not register as dangerous. Autopsies show multiple scars on many areas of the body because the individual did not register the danger of the pain. Now, wait a minute. And there's a picture of a guy that suffers from a kid that suffers from congenital analgesia. In other words, A means not, and G, uh, algesia means to, uh, feel. Uh, he does, he cannot feel. And here he is. He's jumped off of the roof and, and hit himself right between the eyes. Let me show you another picture. Oh, there you go. <laughs> this guy's got a compound fracture, of, and he's got a dislocation of his elbow. Oh, my goodness gracious. didn't even notice that. Anyway, this is, as you can see, uh, both his radius and ulna are, are really shattered, and you can see the bleeding right in, in this area right here, but you can see it's a big a pretty big mess. Not only that, but his his elbow is what they call luxated, which means it has come out of joint. So he's 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 a mess. Anyway, this is a kid with uh, with uh, congenital analgesia. They don't feel pain. You can see this kid smiling. He doesn't care. That's because he has congenital analgesia.
Okay. Pain seems to have three purposes. In the short term, we withdraw from the pain reflexively to prevent further damage. In the long term, pain promotes protective behaviors that in turn promotes recovery. Uh, and, and of course, this is what happens when you get sick. You, one of the reasons that uh, makes you feel tired is because you need to uh, regenerate. You need to recover. And that's why it makes you feel sleepy, uh, makes you not want to do anything, uh, makes you want to take care of yourself. That's what grooming is. Uh, you need to take in food, uh, especially protein, in order to uh, in order to repair yourself. And of course, you need to drink something. Um, so, if you let's say you've got a cold or you've got the flu or something, uh, one of the best remember you need to feed yourself. Um, and you need to feed yourself a protein. Uh, one of the be best ways to cure yourself of, of these problems is by um, consuming uh, chicken soup. And the reason is because the, the reason chicken soup tastes like chicken is because it's got chicken fat in it. And it's that fat that is actually helping you. Um, you know, the fat is, is protein. And that uh, gives you the ability to heal yourself to some extent. So when you know this is a this is an old joke off of television uh, that when somebody gets sick you give them chicken soup or have they give them chicken noodle soup and the reality is this really does help as compared to tomato soup which doesn't really have any protein in it unless it's got some fat in it uh, unless you make it with milk I guess uh, but uh, so. Uh, tomato soup, eh, maybe not, but the chicken noodle soup, yeah, it can actually, it can actually help you because it, got, it has the chicken fat in it. Demonstrating uh, the pain not only acts as a warning to others of the same species, it also elicits caregiving behaviors in others, including uh, them defending you. And if you've ever been around a dog that was hurt, a lot of times the other dogs will come around them uh, to protect them, even though they're, uh, and, and and it's because they're hurt and they want to defend them. And the reason they know this is because they see the pain in that dog. Or the dog will make a sound. The cats will do the same thing. There we go. The initial stimulus for pain is the partial destruction or injury to tissue adjacent to the select nerve fibers. The destruction of the tissue causes a release of chemical substances that activate pain fibers in the skin. One type of receptor is the A-delta receptor. It has a large diameter. It is myelinated so that it go, uh, the information goes very rapidly uh, to the brain. Uh, it's quick reporting. It represents quick, sharp pain. A second type of uh, pain receptor is in the skin or C-fibers. C-fibers are thin, unmyelinated, respond slowly, and adapt slowly. They provide a dull ache. So with the, uh, the A-delta receptor, you get a sharp, quick pain. And with the C-fibers, it tells you, you you are still in pain. It gives you the dull ache. With the initial blow, damaged cells around free nerve endings release serotonin, potassium, prostaglandins, and leukotrienes. Uh, the firing of the nerve endings can uh, excite a reflexive action in the blood vessels and other cells to produce inflammation. And the way that you that, that the inflammation takes place uh, is uh, that it warms the uh, tissue in the area, and it also sends uh, serial fluid. That's the liquid portion of the blood leaks into the tissue to surround it and to to uh, uh, immobilize it. The action potential is reached, and the message is transmitted to the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. The spinal cord, uh, in the spinal cord, the impulse uh, uses the neurotransmitter glutamate to transmit the information to the brain. Along with glutamate, substance P, which and the P stands for peptide, is released, which returns to the injured area through the efferent neurons and induces blood vessels to double their efforts to promote the swelling. Remember, this is, it, we, we have serofluid that's leaking out of, uh, uh, into the area uh, to immobilize it. Uh, so the substance P will will produce even more swelling. So with the first blow, of course, it starts to swell, but then all of a sudden, 
uh, after after a couple seconds, it really swells up a great deal. The mast cells uh, release histi histamine to release serial fluid and induce more benign swelling. And of course, you know this is when you sprain your ankle, when you sprain your wrist. Of course, your wrist uh, uh, swells up, or your ankle swells up, and now now all of a sudden. It's almost like having a, a self-induced cast that is created. An immediate pain message is transmitted to the spinal cord through A-delta neurons, and if necessary, a persistent pain message is transmitted through C-fibers. Information travels up the spinal cord to the various brainstem uh, sites where it is distributed to necessary areas to promote proper uh, behavior such as vocalization. And this is the ouch. Uh, or you can swear uh, these <laughs> these things actually make the pain uh, less severe uh, by vocalizing, and that's because it sends uh, endorphins into your brain to block the pain. The pain message is transmitted to the thalamus through the anterior lateral system of the spinal cord, where it is rerouted to the cingulate cortex. Uh, this area of the brain is highly suggestible and can induce an intense reaction or a minor reaction depending on the attitude of the individual. Uh, my daughter has been talking to my grandson about this. Uh, he plays football and soccer and uh, when we first started this year, it, it's been a bad summer. Uh, he spent uh, the summer with his dad down in Florida and part of the problem was he didn't really do anything while he was down there. He didn't play. Usually he goes down there and he, he has soccer clinics and he has golf clinics and he has tennis clinics. But this time, because of COVID-19, uh, he didn't do anything. So he kind of sat there all summer and, and he, he got a little plump. But that wasn't the real problem. The real problem was that he wasn't really used to... Uh, banging around. He wasn't used to running into things. He wasn't used to hurting himself a little bit. And so when he came back down here and he started playing soccer this uh, this fall, uh, every time he got knocked over, every time he uh, got hit in the you know in the face or whatever, or somebody pushed him, he started crying. And you know it was it was that was his attitude. Um, since since the beginning of the season, uh, he played football today and he got shoved and, and pushed around a, a lot because the kids were a lot bigger than him. Uh, and he didn't cry at all. I mean, he got, he got thrown to the ground a couple times and he just got right back up. Um, it all has to do with your attitude. And of course, his attitude now, um, he's kind of spoiled down in Florida he's, and his mom sure doesn't spoil him here. Uh, so his attitude has gotten a lot better. And that's, one of the reasons why he he doesn't react to pain like he did before. She wants she's trying to toughen him up. Chronic pain is uh, difficult to control because even when a pathway is blocked or severed, uh, the pain message tends to find a way around the block. And this is the problem with chronic pain. So if you've got a a backache, uh, if you've got lower back pain uh, that you've had for six months or a year or eighteen months or whatever. Uh, part of the problem is uh, the fact that uh, we can give you something for it, and it, it's going to work right now. But eventually, it's not going to it's not going to work anymore. You know, if we give you ibuprofen and we keep increasing the, the the dosage, or we give you an opiate, you know, hydrocodone or oxycontin uh, to block the pain, uh, the reality is that the pain's going to come back, and there's not a whole lot we can do about it if it's a chronic pain. Because even if we can block it today, uh, the uh, that pain is going to reroute itself eventually, and it's going to find its way uh, into into your brain, and and the pain's going to come back. This may be because of the transmission of pain messages is modulated at so many different points, and that's the problem. That's how the the pain is trying. The, the pain has has a purpose. The reason the pain is there is to to tell you to do something or to not do something. So it's necessary, and if you've got a chronic pain, it's going to find a way around that block. Prolonged pain messages will potentially require stronger and stronger measures
to control. And this is one of the reasons why we do a lot of different things. Uh, this, is an, this is one of the reasons why they tell you to take Tylenol and then ibuprofen. Uh, they're two different chemical structures. Uh, and, and this is how you break a fever. You don't just take Tylenol. You don't just take ibuprofen. You take you take one and then you take the other, then you take the then you take the first one again. And and of course that different uh, chemical structure uh, will uh, take care is more likely to take care of your problem for a prolonged period of time than if you just use one uh, analgesic. And of course, if you're just taking opiates, of course, uh, if you're just taking opiates and that's all you're doing, uh, then you need to do something else. You, you need to, to uh, use a TENS unit or acupuncture or something to block the pain otherwise. You need to be active in your control of the pain. And if you're only doing it with one measure, then it's going to come back. And there's not a whole lot we can do about it. Opiates uh, have been used uh, for eons as a means of controlling pain. Opiates have a similar chemical structure to the brain's natural pain controller, the neurotransmitters endorphin and enkephalin. Opiates control pain by occupying endorphin receptor sites in the periaqueductal area of the spinal cord. Now, strangely enough, I am not sensitive to opiates, so they do not do anything for me. I've, uh, uh, the first time I had surgery, I had my tonsils taken out when I was 20 years old. They gave me codeine, uh, which is an opiate, of course. Uh, they gave me codeine, and it didn't touch the pain. Uh, I chewed aspergum, and the pain went away. So the only way I could control the pain in my throat was to chew aspergum. Uh, the codeine didn't work, and I tried it and tried it, and I just couldn't get it to work. So I had a feeling that the opiates were that there, there was a problem with the opiates. Um, you know, I'm not real bright, so it took me a couple other times. So I had surgery on my knee, orth orthoscopic surgery on my knee. They gave me hydrocodone to take care of the pain. Um, I took the hydrocodone. It's, it would hurt. I mean, after the uh, anesthesia wore off, it really hurt because he had been, you know, digging around in my, in my, uh, in my knee. Uh, he'd taken, he uh, shaved uh, two... A torn meniscus. Uh, I had a buckled meniscus that he had to pull out. Uh, he trimmed my ACL. Trimmed it. When I say trimmed, I mean he cut it off. Cut the rest of it off. Anyway, so it really kind of, I mean, it should have hurt. And I took the hydrocodone. Didn't work. Uh, didn't do anything. Didn't touch the pain. T couldn't sleep that night because the pain was so intense. Next morning I took the extra strength Tylenol. Pain was gone. Uh, so as it turns out, I'm not sensitive to opiates, um, and there's about 5% of the population that have a problem or have some degree of, of insensitivity to opiates, and I happen to be one of those individuals. A lot of people, uh, when they take opiates, uh, the opiates are, uh, they, they become nauseous, they become sick from taking it, but I am in completely insensitive to it. Uh, I, I, I had a heart attack in uh, 2010. Uh, they flew me to Great Falls to have surgery. They took me into the operating room and they gave me a bolus of uh, fentanyl and uh, morphine and they started cutting on me. And I was still awake. I wasn't knocked out. And they should have known that anyway, but it was kind of emergency surgery. So they were trying to get things. They were just, you know, they were just jumping into things. And he'd given me the bolus a couple minutes before, uh, didn't knock me out, and he started cutting on me, and, and I told, you know, I waved at him and said, hey, buddy. <laughs> you know, I, actually, he, he detected it because when, when he started to cut on my leg, I, I flinched. Anyway, they had to give me a second bolus, enough to knock out a horse. Anti-inflammatory drugs uh, such as ibuprofen and acetaminophen block prostaglandins and leukotriene synthesis at the injury site. Aspirin blocks prostaglandin synthesis at the injury site, but not leukotrienes. And this is one of the reasons why uh, ibuprofen and acetaminophen work uh, as well as they do. Now, the problem is that both ibuprofen and acetaminophen um, can damage your liver. So, 
you know, that's something to think about. You don't want to take uh, either one, either ibuprofen or acetaminophen over time, uh, uh, over an extended length of time. If you take acetaminophen, uh, you're going to be, uh, it, it does more damage to your liver than ibuprofen does. So that's something to remember. Electrical stimulation of the skin. Uh, one of the newer methods of pain control is the transcutaneous electrical uh, nerve stimulation uh, device, uh, the TENS unit. Uh, I can remember when these were first developed, I was working in a clinic in, uh, in a rural health clinic in Oklahoma, and uh, they had just come out with a TENS unit. This is in 19... Uh, this had to be between 1991 and 1994 because I left Oklahoma in 94. Anyway, they came out with the TENS unit. Uh, uh, we were distributing uh, opiates a lot, and uh, uh, it was a fairly blue-color area, so there were a lot of individuals with back pains and, and shoulder problems and whatnot from trying to lift too much. Anyway, this was... Uh, you know, a godsend. Of course, in the beginning, TENS unit was pretty expensive. Not nearly as expensive now. You can buy them over the counter. Uh, but at that time, they had to be, uh, you had, the doctor had to uh, prescribe them for you. The TENS delivers uh, electrical pulses to the nerves of the skin to, uh, in the area of the pain. The tingling caused by the TENS induces the ex excitation of endorphin, which blocks the pain. Rubbing the area induces shorter term but similar results. Uh, so if you hurt yourself, one of the ways to make it stop hurting is to rub on it. Um, and uh, that will make the pain go away. Uh, but only for the short term, not for the long term. Physicians and researchers have known for a long time that pain can often be controlled by substances that should have no effect on pain. Uh, these substances and techniques are called placebos. And they work because they induce endorphins and encephalins in the brain. Do they really work? Yeah, they really do work. Because even though it's something that really shouldn't uh, uh, take the pain away, uh, because you think it does or whatever, uh, it, uh, it induces the endorphins and the encephalins. And that takes care of the problem. Acupuncture is an ancient means of chronic pain control that uses similar tactile stimulation to induce endorphins in the area. Since chronic pain is often exacerbated by tension in the area, frequently acupuncture allows for enough relaxation of tension to relieve the problem. The body normally tries to control pain through endorphins, enkephalins, and non-opioid receptors. Uh, this allows the injured uh, to flee to safety and not to be hobbled by their injuries. Emotion is a strong primer of either pain expression or pain control. And that is the end of that chapter. That's the end of chapter 8. Now we're going to go into chapter, oh, chapter 9. There we go. And we need to go all the way to the beginning. There we go. That's okay. So we're reading it backwards here. Okay, there we go. Uh, hearing, vestibular, perception, uh, taste, and smell. That's chapter 9. Fun chapter. Let me take a quick drink of my lemonade. Uh, there we go. Okay, all ready to go. Sound is a repetitive change in the pressure of the particular medium, commonly air or water. You can actually hear sound underwater. That's what uh, sonar is uh, for submarines. If you've ever watched the submarine movie, um, when they're trying to find, uh, when a submarine's trying to find something, they'll sing, send out a signal, and, and uh, if there's something out there, it will bounce off of it. And that's the ping that you hear when you're watching a submarine movie. Because it bounces off and comes back, and they can tell how large it is by the, by the area, by the, the sound of the ping. Uh, in the air, air particles are moved by a vibrating mechanical system. The mechanical instrument moves away from the resting position and compresses air particles, causing the air pressure to rise above atmospheric pressure. So all the sounds that you hear in nature, my voice, uh, that what's, what is happening, uh, my voice is, <clears throat> is changing the air pressure, and that's what makes the sound. 
A single alteration of compression and expansion of air is called a cycle. So speech, of course, is not just one cycle, it's, it's a multiple cycles. Uh, if you hear the modulation in my voice, of course, uh, the change of my voice, uh, that is the changing of the cycles. Most of the sounds that we hear are a combination of tones, but some sounds in music are made by single structures and are known as pure tones. Think of this, uh, if you've ever heard an acoustic guitar, somebody plucks the string uh, and you get, uh, you get a very rich tone. But if you've ever uh, held a, an electric guitar uh, that wasn't plugged in, and you pluck a string, you get a really strange sound. And that is because you're only getting one single tone. Normally, when you run it through an amplifier, the amplifier, of course, changes the tone and gives you a richer sound. Now, what's happening with the acoustic guitar? Acoustic guitar, uh, the structure of the acoustic guitar, the sound goes into the sound box inside the, the, uh, the uh, guitar po portion and then it comes back out the hole. If there's no hole there, then it's not an acoustic guitar. <laughs> it doesn't go in and come back out. <laughs> uh, and because of that, the, uh, the acoustic guitar has a rich, far richer sound than the electric guitar that's not plugged in. Uh, so there you go. Frequency, refer frequency refers to the number of cycles uh, per second that a sound has. Uh, the frequency is based in hertz. Amplitude refers to how loud or how large the sound wave is. Amplitude is measured in decibels. So you can think of frequency. Uh, the higher the frequency, uh, the, higher the, uh, the higher the sound. So my wife is a soprano. When she sings, no, she's, yeah, she's a soprano. So when she sings, her voice is very, is, is very high. But uh, uh, if you listen to Cher, if you listen to her sing, she's an alto. Uh, and her voice is much deeper than that. Uh, so my wife, the hertz on my, that my wife sings is, is much higher than, uh, than Cher would sing. And of course, my voice is deeper because I'm a male. And the reason my voice is so deep is because I have a bigger sound box. And that's what your Adam's apple is. Your Adam's apple is a sound box, and it allows for deeper voices. So the deeper your voice, the bigger your, your Adam's apple. That's the way it works. So why do men have, well, we won't go into why men have deeper voices than women do. And here you go. These are, are the dis different decibel levels, as you can see. Rock and roll band, 120 decibels. Jet aircraft at 500 feet overhead. And a rock band have about the same. So when, when you first go into it, if you go to a concert and you first go in, it's really, really loud. And then you're, you adapt, your ears adapt. Uh, but it's the reason it's so loud is because it's really loud. Uh, inside a subway car, uh, I drive, uh, my grandson was complaining, I, I took him for a ride in my Miata the other day, and of course it's a two-seater car, it's all, it also has a uh, canvas top, because it's a convertible of course, and he complained that it was just too loud, normal cars of course, with a hard top, that are much larger cars, where they try to control the sound, it's it's a lot quieter than, than his, than, uh, than my convertible. Didn't like it so much. Even though it was a race car, it kept calling it a race car. Inside an automobile in the city, 80 decibels. Uh, well, okay. Inside a church, hospital room, 40 decibels. In a quiet bedroom when you're trying to go to sleep, about 30 decibels. So there you go. Uh, most sound is a blend of different sounds, music, speech, sounds for, from nature, and these are all called timbers. Uh, one of the reasons that your voice sounds the way it does is because um, you have uh, your vocal cords. Uh, are, are, there are many different vocal cords. And just like you're grabbing the, the neck of a, uh, of a guitar, uh, if you push down all of it at the same time, you get a different sound. 
So if you change the uh, the uh, frets or whatever, I don't know. Anyway, that's one of the reasons why people's voices sound so so distinct. Um, and you, of course, you always have the same number of vocal cords, uh, so your voice always sounds the same. So if you uh, if somebody called my brother, I you know I haven't talked to him in a couple of years. If I called him right now, uh, he would know which brother I was, even though I have three brothers and. Uh, and I've yeah I have three brothers and we all sound pretty much the same but uh, of course he would be able to, to know which one I was because of my voice my voice is different from my my other brothers that and the fact that we kind of live in different places so we all have different accents I live in Iowa uh, I have a brother that lives in South Carolina and he has kind of a southern accent and then uh, my other two brothers live in Indiana, and uh, they have a Hoosier accent, which means that they, uh, they have a Hoosier accent, which means that they pronounce some of their letters differently, usually their vowels. Uh, so if you live up in Canada, you know, uh, people, they overpronounce their O's, and, and they say, they don't say about, they say a boot. You know, curious things like that. So if you, <laughs> when I first went, when I first visited the reservation in uh, in Montana, uh, they've all kind of got a Canadian accent. They overpronounce their O's up there too, you know. And so all of a sudden, I started sounding like you know I'm talking to these people and I'm and I'm overpronouncing my O's just like they do, you know. And uh, so I started sounded like I was a character in Fargo, the movie Fargo, if you've ever seen the movie Fargo. Anyway, you know, and you guys have an accent too, uh, the very distinctive accent. So if, if, uh, if uh, an American Indian comes from the Southwest, of course, they have a different way of, of talking and whatnot. And you can tell that's that has to do with your timbre. The basic sound that is made is called the fundamental, and the lesser additional sounds are the harmonics. Uh, these are known as multiples of the fundamental, and you know it's it's all different sounds. And this is this is what it looks like. Here's your here's your fundamental, and then you've got all your other sounds that are adding to that and making it whatever it sounds like. The hearing apparatus is the ear, which is constructed of three parts. The outer ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear. The outer ear, more, uh, uh, most uh, portion of the ear, is the external ear or the pinna. And this is a pinna. And the reason I have Clark Gable here is because he was notorious for having really big ears. Uh, this is a picture of him. I think he was a captain. Now he's a lieutenant. He's just a lieutenant in the Air Force. You can see how big his ears are. Anyway, those are his, this is his pinna, the part that you can see. The hills and the valleys uh, of the pinna aim the sound uh, waves into the ear, uh, and everybody has a different uh, uh, structure of their ears, as weird as that is. Uh, once upon a time, instead of fingerprints, they used to take ear prints uh, because people had such distinctive ears. The shape of the human ear makes the human speech range somewhere between 200 and 5,000 uh, hertz. Uh, and it really all depends on, uh, well, there's a lot of different factors. When we are first born, we can hear between 200 and 5,000 hertz. As we get older and we, we do horrible things to our ears, uh, shoot guns and uh, drive motorcycles and uh, turn up the radio way way too loud or use chainsaws or or whatever in my case when I was in the service uh, one of the things uh, one of the things that happened to me was that uh, I was in an uh, I was when I was stationed in Germany uh, I was in an explosion kind of but uh, it, it <laughs> kind of deafened my right ear and that's why I don't hear so well out of my right ear anyway the other thing that happened to me was that I worked in the laboratory and I had all these these whining uh, my, uh, sort, uh, centrifuges uh, around me and uh, of course each one blew out uh, a certain uh, frequency of, of hearing so there are certain frequencies I can't hear um, I had a friend who flew uh, jets 
and each jet engine has a different uh, has a different sound. Uh, and he flew three different types of jets, and he has hearing losses at those three frequencies, the uh, with where those jet engines were. Uh, because if you're a pilot, even though the sound is going behind you, you're still sitting on top of the uh, of the uh, the jet engine, and uh, you know just like when you're flying in an airplane, you can hear the the engines making noise. The worst place to sit in an airplane is right over the wings because you're getting the vibrations from the engines. Uh, sitting in, in in front of, and this is one of the reasons why. Uh, the best place to sit in, a, in an airplane is, is in front of the engines because the sound is going backwards. Anyway, so anywhere from the, uh, the wings all the, back to the tail is not very good. The inner portion of the outer ear is that which an individual can stick a Q-tip into. Hopefully nothing sharper than a Q-tip, of course. <laughs> Otherwise you'll, you'll rupture your tympanic membrane. The end of the ear canal is the tympanic membrane, or the eardrum, which amplifies the sound wave. Uh, the middle ear is a fluid-filled chamber, the three ossicles and the eustachian tube. It's, there's not that much there. As you can see, there's three bones, and there is the, uh, the, this, the, the main chamber, and then the eustachian tube. This is the eustachian tube. The tympanic membrane touches the malleus, uh, or the... Malleus is Latin for hammer. It looks kind of looks like a hammer, uh, which vibrates the incus or the anvil, which kind of looks like an anvil, which in turn vibrates the stapes, and of course stapes is Latin for stirrup, and it actually looks like a stirrup. These are the bones of the ossicles. Ossicles just means small bone, and they are tiny. The ossicles are controlled by the, the uh, tensor tin tympani uh, attached to the malleus and the eardrum, uh, and the st uh, stapedius, uh, which is attached to the uh, stapes. These are all muscles. The muscles of the middle ear contract and prevent the ossicles from being so sensitive to sound. So the first time you walk into a, 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 a concert where the music is really loud, uh, one of the things that will happen is these muscles will react and they'll pull the the uh, hammer anvil and the stirrup away from one another uh, so that you will uh, not lose your hearing so it won't damage the three the three ossicles. The stapes of the middle ear vibrates against the oval window of the inner ear. <clears throat> the inner ear will convert the mechanical energy of the sound wave into an electrical impulse that will be read as sound in the brain. The auditory portion of the inner ear is called the cochlea, which is Greek for snail, and that's the cochlea right there. As you can see, it actually looks like a snail. <clears throat> the cochlea is embedded deep in the temporal bone and is about the size of a pea, and this is one of the reasons why you can hear vibrations. This is another reason why uh, your voice sounds one way to you, and then when you hear a recording, you go, oh, that doesn't sound like me. Uh, because you're hearing it uh, through the cochlea, which is in, in reality you're hearing the vibrations. You get the vibrations from your skull. So it sounds different th to you than it actually uh, sounds to everybody else. Unroll the cochlea is about one and a half inches long, so as you, as you can, this thing's not very big. The oval window opens at the base of the cochlea. The length of the cochlea contains three non-compressible fluid-filled parallel chambers, the tympanic canal, the vestibular canal, and the middle canal. The basilar membrane separates the tympanic canal and the middle canal. This membrane vibrates in response to sound. Within the middle cha uh, canal, uh, and on top of the basilar membrane is the organ of corti, and the organ of corti is actually your receptor cell for hearing. The organ of corti contains the sensory cells of the ear. There are four rows of sensory cells, one row of 3,500 flask-shaped inner hair cells, uh, three rows of cylinder-shaped uh, outer hair cells of 4,000 cells each. So you got lots of hair cells in there. Uh, to, to hear with. 
Uh, as you go through life, of course, these become damaged. Some of, the, some of these become damaged and non-functional, but you can still hear. And the reason you can still hear is because there are so many of them, and you don't destroy them all, hopefully. There you go. There was other, the, uh, those are the uh, cylinder-shaped cells. Each hair cell has 50 to 200 stiff hairs called stereocilii or, uh, or cilia. Uh, the cilia of the, uh, of the outer hair cell extends into the indentations of the tectoral membrane that covers the organ of corti. The auditory nerve fibers can contact the base of the inner hair cells. 90 to 95 percent of afferent neurons are connected to the inner hair cells. Each inner hair cell is associated with 16 to 20 auditory nerve uh, fibers. The afferent nerve fibers run to the cochlear nucleus of the brainstem. The outer hair cell is associated with modulating acoustic stimulation by lengthening and shortening to receive different frequencies. As the stapes moves, it causes movement in the fluid of the vestibular canal. Different frequencies of the sound uh, cause vibrations that stimulate different areas of the basilar membrane. Higher frequencies down near the window, lower frequencies farther away. So if the damage is done, it's usually done closer to the, uh, closer to the window. Uh, the, uh, the uh, what am I talking about? The basilar membrane. The, the closer it is to the eardrum, the uh, more likely there is going to be damage. Now the higher frequencies are heard closer to the uh, eardrum. And for this reason, uh, people lose their high-frequency sound uh, far more readily than they do their deep sounds. People rarely uh, go deaf in uh, as far as deep sounds are concerned. They can hear they can hear sounds uh, that are deep, and that uh, and that's okay. If you remember the first episode, <laughs> it wasn't the first episode. It was, uh, or was it the first episode? I guess it was the first episode of the Big Bang Theory. Uh, Sheldon and uh, uh, Leonard went into into Penny's room, into her, her apartment, to clean up her apartment, as weird as that is. Um, and uh, the way they kept her from waking up um, is by speaking deeply, because a woman is more likely to respond to high-pitched voices, just like a baby's voice, than she is to a deep voice. Uh, she won't respond to the deep voice. So they were able to speak with a deep voice and uh, not wake Penny up, as weird as that is. And that's all true, too, by the way. The tips of the cilia uh, of each hair are connected with narrow threads called tip links. As the cilia is moved from sound vibrations, the tip link starts a process of depolarization. Uh, each tip link is connected to a, a potassium channel that when open depolarizes the cell. As the depolarization reaches the base of the cell, calcium channels are opened and the syn synaptic vesicles release the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. So once again, we acetylcholine has to do with memory. It also has to do with hearing and it uh, has to do with mem uh, movement. So acetylcholine is very important uh, as far as our body, human body is concerned. Because of this delicate mechanism, very low sounds can be detected. And of course, the farther away from the, uh, from the, uh, the, uh, the eardrum, the farther away the, the vibrations come, the deeper the, the, the sound. So if we're going to lose something, if we're going to damage something, it'll probably be the high frequency sounds. Uh, so you won't be able to hear. The ear actually makes its own noises, as weird as that sounds. The cochlea makes noises in response to noises that it hears, evoked, and this is known as evoked uh, autoacoustic emissions. In some people, it produces continuous sounds known as spontaneous autoacoustic emissions, or SOAEs. Uh, Two-thirds of women and a half, uh, half of men produce SOAEs. These individuals can actually they have more sensitive hearing than people who don't have SOAEs. Uh, so as you can see, women are more sensitive to sound. Now, why would that be? Because when the baby cries, uh, somebody has to respond. Uh, 
uh, two thirds of oops, two thirds of women and half of men have very sensitive uh, hearing, far more sensitive hearing than other people. Uh, one of the things they want you to do when you join the military is to be able to hear, so they always give you hearing tests. The other problem that you have in the military is a lot of people lose their hearing because they don't really try to control noise. Lots of noise in the military. Whether it's jet engines or, or uh, howitzer blasts or machine guns or you know all, all sounds all over the place, and they don't try to to limit the sounds. If you've ever ridden in a in a military uh, vehicle like a Jeep or a Humvee or or a deuce and a half, <clears throat> they don't. There's it's it's loud. It's always really, really loud. So one of the things they do is they measure your hearing. Uh, I made, When my hearing was measured when I first joined the service, they said, it's perfect. You can hear just about anything. And then when I, uh, I was in for 12 years, and when I got out, they gave me my hearing test. And they said my hearing was still pretty good. Uh, so I'm guessing that I do, I have uh, SOAEs spontaneous autoacoustic emissions because I can hear so well. Uh, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Each afferent uh, nerve cell feeds into auditory nerve, which uh, into the auditory nerve, which enters the brain in the pons and in an area known as the superior olivary uh, nucleus. This in turn delivers a message to the inferior colliculus and uh, the medial geniculate uh, nucleus before it enters the auditory uh, cortex. And the auditory cortex is in the temporal lobe of your brain. There are three forms of deafness. Uh, conduction deafness, uh, disorders of the outer or inner ear, prevents vibration from reaching the cochlea. We can take care of conduction deafness by giving you a hearing aid. And the hearing aid, all it does is it collects the sound and it creates a vibration in your ear. Uh, and it replaces your what, whatever's broken in there. It replaces it, and it sends the sound uh, into your cochlea. Uh, my mother had uh, a hearing loss. She was really kind of funny. Uh, if she didn't want to hear you, she just <laughs> turned off her hearing aid. <laughs> so if somebody was saying something she didn't like, she'd turn off her hearing aid. She's kind of funny. <clears throat> Sensory neural deafness, uh, disorders of the cochlea or the nerve fibers, that conduct information to the brain and the and central uh, deafness disorders in the brain auditory regions. Only conduction deafness can be uh, corrected. Well, actually, if the cochlea is damaged, we can we can put an artificial cochlea on the on your skull. Sensory neural deafness uh, can be caused by many different factors. There are hundreds of hereditary diseases that can cause destruction to the cochlea or the cochlear neurons. Uh, Drug-induced deafness also can affect the cochlea and its neurons. The antibiotics streptomycin and genomycin can damage the hair cells in the cochlea. Uh, if the babe, if the mother, this is one of the reasons why if a, mother, a woman's pregnant, she can't take either of these. These are both, um, uh, wait a minute. Uh, I can't think what they are. Anyway, they're 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 old. Genomycin and streptomycin are both old uh, antibiotics. We don't use them anymore. We try not to anyway. Aspirin use uh, coupled with loud noises can reduce cochlear sensitivity and tinnitus, uh, the sensation of ringing in the ears. And of course, I have tinnitus. Sadly, I have tinnitus. So I uh, right now I can hear my ears ringing. Sensory, uh, the most frequent cause of sensory neural deafness is loud noises or continuous noises at the same pitch. Initially, outer hair cells are more sensitive to loud or intense noises, but eventually the entire organ of corti can be destroyed by loud noises. Loud, sharp noises seem to be the most destructive, such as the reports of guns, motorcycle engines, and intense music. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been uh, driving down the road, you stop at a stoplight, somebody comes up to you, they've got uh, their bass is so loud that it vibrates your car. It actually vibrates your car. So you can imagine what it's like being inside that car and how much damage they're doing to their hearing. 
While the cochlea allows uh, people to hear, the rest of the apparatus attached to the cochlea allows us to keep our balance. There are three parts to the vestibular system. When we're talking about keeping your balance, I want you to think of a roller coaster and why roller coasters are so much fun for people. Uh, it's because they, they get sensations that they very rarely get. Uh, and for this reason, of course, people really, some people really like roller coasters. They like being turned upside down. They like going fast and then going around a sharp turn where it slams their head this way or that way. And the reason that it's so stimulating is because of the uh, vestibular system. The vestibular system is suddenly is suddenly uh, being activated. Uh, but of course, if you've ever been in a helicopter, it's about the same thing. <laughs> And the three parts of the vestibular system are the semicircular canals, the saccule, and the utricle. The receptors of the vestibular system are hair cells uh, similar to the auditory system that are located throughout the semicircular canals. At the base of each of the three semicircular canals is a structure called an ampulla. Uh, an ampulla is actually uh, Latin for a receptacle it's a receptacle that has that has a rounded bottom, and you would think, now why in the world would they make they make why would you make a bottle that uh, you couldn't set down on, on on a flat surface? And the reason is because uh, they would have a stand for it, and this was uh, for a wine. That's what ampulla was. It was for wine, and the wine would settle in the pointed end, uh, or the uh, uh, the solid material in the wine would would settle at the bottom. And then it wouldn't get in into the uh, into the wine, and it made the wine better. In the ampulla, uh, the cilia of the hair cells are embedded in a gelatinous mass. Uh, each hair is, as you can see, the ampulla looks. This is what it looks like. So you can see it's kind of I don't know what I don't know what you'd call that. Anyway, that's that's what the uh, these structures look like that they used to put wine in. Each hair is very delicate and quite precise in the kind of mechanical force that it is sensitive to. The three semicircular canals are at right angles to each other and detect angular acceleration in any direction. And this is the stimulation that we're talking about. The receptors in the saccule and the utricle uh, respond to the static position of the head. Small bony crystals on the gelatinous uh, membrane called otoliths uh, increase the sensitivity of these uh, receptors to movement. At the base of the hair cells and these receptors are nerve fibers connected to a similar manner to that of the auditory hair cells. And this is what these otoliths looked like. This is actually a, a fish otolith. The, these are human otoliths. And as you can see, they're, 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 they, they're crystalline. They look like crystals. Most of the nerve cells of the vestibular receptors enter the lower level of the brainstem and synapse at a group of nuclei called the vestibular nuclei. While some of the nerve cells tie directly into the cerebellum, those that pass through the vestibular nuclei tie into various motor and muscular control areas of the brain. Motion sickness is caused by low frequency movements due to acceleration. Motion sickness is usually worse for the passenger than for the driver who can brace for the movements or they can control the movements that make them uncomfortable. Motion sickness can also be induced when the fluid in one ear is warmer than another as when an individual has inner ear infection. And I used, I've had a couple inner ear infections and I'll tell you, you can't stand up. You feel, you feel, like, you feel like the world is spinning around. It's the oddest thing in the world. Uh, and you got to get it fixed, or you you'll you can't uh, you throw up and uh, you get motion sickness really really bad. It's terrible. Um, the chemical senses, uh, human sense of taste, is based on survival needs. Since sugar is the energy source for all of our cells, it is important that we are able to detect sugar in our foods to ingest as much as possible. Salty and sour foods indicate uh, to us important ion structures that help us maintain our homeostasis. Bitter substances warn us of toxic substances. Taste receptors are located on small projections from the surface of the tongue called papillae. 
Uh, each papilla uh, holds one or, or more clusters of 50 to 150 cells. Most of these cells are taste buds. The taste buds are arranged in, in a depression that can catch fluids. Uh, the chemical testant enters the taste bud through the taste pore. Taste cells extend cilia into the taste pore uh, to detect different chemicals. So it has to, you can only taste something that uh, you can, uh, if you've got saliva in your mouth, of course, you can put anything in your mouth and taste it. Uh, but if it, if it, you can't break it down into a, a liquid, then you can't taste it. It has no taste. Some of the sensory cells in the taste buds are pain and touch sensors that detect hot foods such as jalapenos uh, or habaneros. Uh, taste buds only last for 10 to 15 or 14 days before being replaced. There are three different structures of taste buds, and it has to do with their shape. Fungiform looks like a mushroom. Circum, uh, valate, uh, circumvallate means rampart around. This is actually a circumvallate uh, taste bud. And the others are folate or many layers, and this is, it looks like an onion, and this is a, a uh, foliate uh, taste bud. You, you know what mushrooms look like. <laughs> Salty taste uh, comes from the sodium being transported across the membranes of taste cells. Uh, the entry of sodium ions depolarizes the taste cells and activates the afferent neurons. Uh, sour, the sour taste is usually an acidic compound that releases a, a, a hydrogen ion. The hydrogen ion blocks the, the potassium channels. The buildup of potassium depolarizes the cell and causes the stimulation of an afferent neuron, indicating an acidic uh, flavor. Sweet tastes uh, may be from slow metabotropic uh, synaptic uh, receptors that involve G proteins and second messengers. And this is one of the reasons that uh, sweet and sour is, is something. Uh, when you first taste it, it tastes sour, uh, but it takes a while for that sweet taste to, to uh, be registered in your brain. Sour taste registers right away. The acidic taste uh, registers right away. The mechanism is not completely known for the sweet taste, but it's slow. Uh, so if you put something that's sweet in your mouth, it takes a, little, it takes a couple seconds before, uh, before you can detect it. If you put something sour in your mouth, it's detectable right away. If you put something salty in your mouth, it's detectable right away as well. And also, if you put something bitter in your mouth, it's, it's detectable right away because uh, bitter tastes are usually toxins and they need to be spit out because they will poison you. The bitter taste mechanism is equally complex and may actually be different from, for each toxin. Studies have been done looking at bitter chemical phenyl uh, thiocarbamide, and they have discovered that about one in four individuals cannot actually taste the substance. They have also determined that those who do not have the ability to taste the substance have fewer taste buds on their tongue. This is really weird because when I was at a conference in... Uh, or was I Tampa, uh, Tampa, Florida? They gave us some of this stuff. Now we this is a whole room. Looks like a two hundred um, uh, psychologists sitting there, and it was really weird because some of us had a really strong, uh, some of us had a really strong reaction to the phenyl thiocarbamide, and other people didn't have much of a reaction at all. There were hardly any people that couldn't couldn't taste it. Uh, but I tasted it, and, and I had a, had a 20 ounce uh, bottle of Coke. Uh, and of course, I tried to wash it out of my mouth with water, it didn't really work. Uh, so I kept drinking that Coke, trying to get rid of that flavor. And it took me through, that, through the whole Coke to get rid of that taste. It stuck with me for an extended length of time. And it turns out I'm a super taster, and that really irritates my wife a little bit because. There's some things I won't eat because <laughs> they taste bad. I, I, I don't like mushrooms because they taste like dirt. <laughs> and they're, I, I don't like watermelon. I won't tell you why what it tastes like to me, but it doesn't taste good. Umami, uh, which is Japanese for good taste, may be a fifth taste. 
It is described as a meaty or a savior, savory uh, flavor. Researchers have discovered that monosodium glutamate stimulates the umami taste buds. Turns out that a lot of people are, well, maybe not a lot of people, but there are some people in the United States who are, who are uh, allergic to monosodium glutamate. And it's one of the reasons why if you used to eat Chinese food and it was tasted really good, but it uh, doesn't taste so good anymore. And the reason is because they can't put monosodium glutamate in the Chinese food anymore. And uh, it, it uh, gave it its uh, distinctive flavor. The umami uh, receptors detect amino acids, uh, which is abundant in the protein of meats. Umami receptors seem to be shared with the taste buds that detect sweet. This is really kind of fascinating to me because, well, we're going to talk about pheromones in just a minute. A study done by National Geographic Graphic Magazine showed that half the people that, they, that uh, tried their test were able to detect all the odors that they presented to them. One third of the people tested were not able to detect the sweat odor. They couldn't smell body odor. 29% were not able to detect the musk smell. And the musk smell is a sexual smell. Uh, anyway, so we've got all of these individuals. Uh, one third of the people couldn't smell, sell, smell sweat. 29% couldn't smell the, the, uh, a sexual odor. Um, that's like a third of the population can't smell uh, sexual odors or sweat, as weird as that is. And we're going to talk about this in just a second. Women were sli slightly better than men at detecting odors. The ability to, te to detect odors declined with age. Smokers tended to have a dulled sense of smell. And if you've ever gone into a nursing home, uh, it's, it smells bad. And the, one of the you go, how could you stand to live here? And the answer is that as people age, they lose their sense of smell. Odors are detected by a sheet of cells along the top of the nasal cavity called the olfactory epithelium. In order to smell something, it has to be able to uh, dissolve in water. Uh, it, it has, there has to be moisture to it. And if there's no moisture to it, you can't smell it. Each receptor cell has a long, slender, apical dendrite that extends to the outermost layer of the epithelium, the mucosal surface. And this is one of the reasons why if there's too much mucus coming out here, you can't smell anything at all. And that's why when you have a cold, you lose your sense of smell. And you also lose your sense of taste. The reason is because you can't smell it. It doesn't have an aroma. At the mucosal surface, uh, numerous cilia emerge from the dendritic knob and extend along the mucosal surface. At the opposite end of each olfactory receptor cell, a tiny unmyelinated axon runs to the olfactory bulb. Olfactory neurons are constantly being replaced. Odorants uh, enter the nasal cavity in the form of free-floating chemical molecules in the air during inhalation. And as I said, if it won't break down in water, then you can't smell it. The odorants uh, first encounter the mucosal layer, which binds the chemical to a protein for transport to the olfactory epithelium. Good example is uh, natural gas. Natural gas has no smell. So, uh, in order, or or the gas that they that they pump into your house, and in order for you to detect uh, whether you have a gas leak or not, they put sulfur in it, and sm sulfur smells like rotten eggs. So if you, if you smell rotten eggs uh, when you're around a, a, a gas line, it means there's a gas leak. But they do that so that you can detect it. Otherwise, it would kill you and you'd never know it because you couldn't smell it. The viscosity of the mucus layer determines how rapidly an odorant reaches the cilia of the olfactory receptor. So if you've got a chronic uh, runny nose, uh, then you don't smell things very well and, and things don't taste very good to you. And one of the reasons is because you've got too much mucus in your nose and you can't really uh, taste it. Uh, or if you have, if your nose is too dry, if your nose is too dry, you, you can't, uh, there's no moisture in there to uh, mix with uh, so that you can actually smell something. The odorant uh, then reacts with the receptor proteins located on the surface of the olfactory cilia and dendritic knob of the receptor cells. 
These proteins are members of the complex family of proteins referred to as G-protein-linked receptors. The G-protein-linked receptor combines with a molecule of GTP, which displaces GDP. We saw this before, the second messenger system. The G-protein alpha subunit dissociates and activates adenyl cyclase, which produces uh, cyclic uh, AMP. Uh, cyclic AMP binds the sodium channel and opens it. Uh, sodium enters the cell. This creates a generator potential, which is interpreted in the brain as a specific odor. The receptor protein returns to an unbound state. Uh, it is We can detect uh, 10,000 different odors, and we can tell the difference between one and the other. If we smell, if the gasoline from uh, BP smells different uh, than uh, the gasoline from... Uh, Marathon, uh, you know which gasoline you're putting in your, your tank because of the smell. As weird as that seems. Okay, so we can detect t tens of thousands of, of different odors. Uh, we can tell the difference between chocolate chip cookies and uh, uh, whatever other cookies you want to make. Uh, Fig Newtons or whatever. Uh, it's really kind of strange. Anyway. So now we're going to talk about pheromones. Uh, this is really controversial because humans, we know that animals have pheromones. I talked about this earlier, that uh, animals have pheromones. So the question is, do humans and can they detect it? Uh, and the answer is, see, this is where you smell. Oops, I'm sorry. I didn't mean for that to happen. This is where you smell things. And this is where your vomeronasal organ is. Now, this is what detects pheromones, this little little thing right there. And as you can see, as, you are, uh, as odors are coming into your nose, it hits this thing before it hits this thing up here. And for that reason, this, um, uh, your brain thinks about this stuff, uh, whatever you're smelling. Your brain detects it this, and, and it senses it. The vomeronasal organ, this is kind of uh, in, instinctual. Uh, so if you smell something and it smells, it's and they're human pheromones. And human pheromones are supposed to be uh, sexual attractants. Uh, so if you've ever been around two different people and uh, one person uh, you found more uh, stimulating for one reason or another, it might have been the fact that they smelled better. And of course it has nothing to do with body, well it does have, something to do with body odor, but some people don't put it off. The interesting thing is that uh, uh, groups of individuals who have had uh, arranged marriages for an extended length of time, they tend to not put off nearly as many pheromones, or any at all, uh, than people who uh, uh, don't have arranged marriages. The Europeans put off uh, pheromones. Um, Af people from Africa put off pheromones. People from Japan, where they've had arranged marriages for thousands of years, they don't put off pheromones, as weird as that is. And I've got, I've got a story about <laughs> Japanese. <laughs> about the Japanese. I don't know if I should tell it to you. Uh, anyway, um, so being a European, I can, I can detect sexual odors because I have a vomeronasal organ. And I, I know I have one because I have responded to, uh, to odors from people before. Odors from females, I'm not... Uh, yeah, okay, anyway. While researchers have thought uh, the vomeronasal organ vestigial in humans and other higher primates, the organ still exists and some people report responding to it. I've responded to it. Uh, about 20% of humans do not have a vomeronasal organ. Uh, they, you, because of the way that we are, have, have been doing things uh, lately, we don't say, oh, this uh, individual with, uh, who has um, African heritage has a vomeronasal organ, and this person with an Asian heritage doesn't have one. We don't say that anymore. Uh, and there are some Asians that do have a vomeronasal organ, but as a European, I know I've got one. And uh, I'm going to show you about pheromones right now. Okay. Let's go here. There we go. Well, I 
Are you looking for love and failing to find it? In the past, retailers have sold love potions that claim to attract the opposite sex, even though none of it's been proven to work. So we were curious about the new batch of potions with the secret ingredient pheromones. They're in some of the new Christmas fragrances, but do they work? Bill Ritter did a little experiment to see if they're too good to be true. I think our product is the only product that has any proof behind its claims. Biologist Winifred Cutler is perhaps the nation's leading pheromone champion. She claims her pheromones work for 75% of the people who use them. The price for one-sixth of an ounce of her pheromones, sold through a company she calls the Athena Institute, is $100. Our pheromones are sexual attractants. They do make the wearers more sexually attractive. That's very clear. Oh yeah, I know what you're thinking. Why would attractive 20-somethings even need pheromones? After all, it's those of us who are no longer in our 20s who could probably use a little help. Women in their 40s are not excreting the same level of pheromones they might have been when they were in their 20s or their 30s. And for those women, adding the, the pheromone to their perfume can be just the kick that restores some of what they, they thought they had lost. So to see if pheromones work on middle-aged women, we enlisted the help of Kathleen and Lisa Ann, both over 40, both still single. Lisa Ann is a newspaper reporter, and she was excited to find out if this would work. I do get attention, and um, I do have some dates, but I do not have a committed relationship, which I would like to have. Kathleen calls herself New York's Lady Barber, and she says she's never had That's any nice. trouble meeting men, but... I'm one of eight kids, and when I go home to my families for Christmas, everyone's married with kids except me. I just would love to have a boyfriend for Christmas this year. This, now see, I'm going to cry. This is so pathetic. So Kathleen and Lisa Ann <laughs> agreed to wear the pheromones every day and keep a video diary. Hi, this is Kathleen Giordano reporting for pheromone duty. I'm getting lots more attention on the street, so I have to assume that the pheromones are working. I'm wondering if I'm seeing any changes. Only subtle so far. Don't have men falling over me yet. Crossing 2nd Avenue this evening. Three guys, three friends, walking abreast, crossing the avenue, said, Oh my God, you are so beautiful. I'm still not noticing a whole lot of action. <laughs> I don't think that too. <laughs> yes? Okay, good. Lisa Ann was trying. She even learned to tango maybe the sexiest dance ever invented, but she stayed mostly on the sidelines. One month into the experiment, Kathleen and Lisa Ann got together to compare notes. Kathleen was dating three to four times a week, more than ever. He said, what are you doing Saturday? I said, I have no plans. He said, you do now. Oh, yeah! So the work part of my life is good. The dating part of my life can use some improvements. We'll check back with Lisa Ann and Kathleen after another month has passed. Coca-Cola doesn't say what's in its formula. Athena does not either. We checked back with our 40-something women. Kathleen still didn't have a Christmas date, but she remained convinced that pheromones were working. I think the pheromones are like that added little secret a woman keeps in her arsenal. And as for Lisa Ann, something of a surprise. She's become a pheromone convert. It took a really long time and I was really beginning to suspect it was hooey, but something started to happen. There was a transition. On a cold December night, Lisa Ann and her date keep each other warm. And guess what? She's already decided what to buy herself for Christmas. A new supply of pheromones. Okay. Uh, I'll talk about pheromones in just a second. Let's do one more. This is kind of fun. Maybe? There we go. Okay. Have you ever seen a really ugly bloke walking around with a gorgeous woman and thought, how? Well, is this the answer? Pheromone spray, available from your local sex shop. Now, it claims to make you irresistible, even if you're a short, fat, ugly bloke with no money and all the personality of an ironing board. Hmm. But does it work? This is Julie. Julie is lovely. 
Julie wants a boyfriend. Which man is right for her? We've got a random selection of three fellas for her to choose from, all with their own distinctive smells. Which one will she choose for her blind date? Arms up, please. Love, it's all your face. The look, the time, the rain. The mind, the night. Uh. That the spirit just passed out of so many nights like this. Let's take a look at something and see if it's a kiss. I can hardly wait to hold you, feel my arms around you. How long I have waited, waited just to love you. Now that I have found you, don't and stop sniffing, please. Shaver, or will it be Mr. Sweaty? The results coming up. Back to our blind date. Our lovely lady Julie is ready to choose her new boyfriend just on the basis of his smell from three fellas chosen from a cross section of society. Dell wore the sex shop pheromone spray. Its main constituent is androstenol, a factory made chemical which mimics men's natural sex hormones. A liberal splashing of it should drive women crazy, but does it? Our other men smell of natural sweat and aftershave. Will they turn her head instead? She sniffed them all, and now she has to choose her favourite. Please take your blindfold off. So tell me about number one. Um, who's going to stunk? Really? Yeah. Of what? B.O., I would say B.O. Okay. And tell me about number two. He's not nice, a lot better than number one. Yeah? And what about number three? He was in between. Nice, in some areas. A bit, a bit stinky in others. Mediocre. Yeah. Okay, who have you chosen to be your blind date for this evening? Number one, number two, or number three? Well, it's got to be number two. Definitely number two. Okay, so you've chosen number two. So let's meet the two that you've turned down. Come in, Fabio. <laughs> Sorry. Come in, Dal. Hi! <laughs> Sorry. And your blind date for this evening is Jimmy from Scunthorpe, and he was wearing aftershave. Come in, Jimmy. <laughs> so there it is. Cheap aftershave beats pheromones every time. Splash it all over, boys. <laughs> Funny stuff. Okay, let me tell you a couple, couple of quick stories uh, about pheromones. The thing about pheromones, we, we know they exist, and we know that, that they are chemical structures, and we know that they are, are pseudo-sexual odor, odors. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that they were spraying it in, in different areas. And we all put off pheromones. You can taste your own pheromones. Well, yeah, okay, we, we all have these odors about us. Uh, but like I said, there are some people that don't have them, and that's because they've had arranged marriages for an extended length of time. They didn't have to produce uh, smells in order to attract a mate. <clears throat> so why in the world do we have pheromones? Okay, so the idea is that uh, um, we, we all have our immune systems, and some of our immune systems have flaws in them. 
all of our immune systems have flaws in them. So what you need to do is you need to be able to uh, mate with somebody who corrects those flaws in your immune system as best that they possibly can. So what they did, they did a study in Switzerland, and what they discovered was that women were attracted to men who corrected the flaws in their immune system. So the uh, pheromones have a, a, an immune system fingerprint uh, that tells you who you should be attracted to, uh, who you should be mating with. You would be mating with somebody that corrects your your uh, your immune system, and of course, like I said, we all have flaws in our immune system, uh, whether we're male or female. And some males could correct some female flaws, I guess, they're in their immune system anyway. So that we know that they do exist. Okay, so let me tell you a quick story. Uh, my wife is stationed in uh, in Korea, and uh, I was going over to visit her. Uh, for my birthday. <laughs> I hadn't seen her for six months, so it had been a while since I'd seen my wife. I really wanted to see her, if you know what I mean. Anyway, so here I am. Uh, uh, so I had to fly to Korea. And in order to fly to Korea, you have to fly to Japan, and then from Japan you fly to Korea. So uh, I got on a plane. I Actually, I was I was in Oklahoma at the time, so I got on a plane in Oklahoma, flew to Los Angeles, then I got on a JAL flight, and this was a flight that started at uh, like 11 o'clock at night, and it was an 18-hour flight that flew around. You don't fly directly across the Atlantic. It's too dangerous, so what you do is you fly around the, uh, the Pacific Rim. You fly up to, to Alaska and then down. Uh, and then you d fly down to Tokyo. So you fly up and then down. And that's what we did. Not Like I said, it was an 18-hour flight. And and um, uh, the stewardesses on the uh, JAL flight, JAL stands for J Japanese Airlines, uh, the stewardesses were Japanese, of course, and they were these, you know, these, these ladies, and they were running up and down. There were probably five, six hundred people on the flight. And they were, you know, there were like 18 of them, and they were just running up and down, and they were uh, delivering your meals, and they gave you hot towels. And, I mean, it was really kind of interesting. And if somebody had a complaint, you know. Okay. Anyway, so um, 18 hours, and these ladies, these ladies had been running uh, up and down. Uh, it was a jumbo jet. It was one of those two two story th things and I was up on the second story uh, of the jet as weird as that I couldn't find my seat in the beginning <laughs> because it was a number that was up above and I kept walking up and down I couldn't find it and finally I I found it anyway uh, 18 hours in flight and so we got off the flight and be since I was going to a lot of people were uh, stopping in Japan uh, but I was going on to Korea and since I was going to Korea I didn't have to go through uh, customs. Uh, I just went right uh, directly to the uh, to the airport. It had been an 18-hour flight. We we're going to have a layover in uh, in in uh, Tokyo, Narita Airport in Tokyo. Anyway, uh, so I I was able to get on the uh, they had a monorail that ran from where you got off the plane and where customs were and uh, to the terminal. And it was about two miles from, one was two miles from the other. So they had this monorail that took you from the, uh, from, from where you landed, uh, where customs were, to the, uh, to the terminal. And since I didn't have to uh, go through customs, I, I was able to go get on the, uh, uh, the plane or the, the train first. Uh, and the second people, second group of people that got on the train were the Japanese stewardesses. And so, if I, you've never, if you've never been on a Japanese subway before, they're really, they're really crowded. Uh, so when I, I didn't think about this when I got on the plane or on the train, uh, so I, I just kind of went into the, one of the corners, and all of a sudden, uh, and they, it fills in from where wherever you go, and so it's not like everybody you know spreads out. Uh, they all go to one end, and that's exactly what happened. So I'm, I'm down in one corner and all the stewardesses. And so here I am, I'm surrounded by stewardesses. I got stewardesses in front of me. I got them to, the, to each side of me. And of course, 
these ladies have been have been running up and down and sweating. You know, I'm, well, I'm, you know, they have been working for 18 hours straight. Uh, so here I am. I'm surrounded by all these stewardesses, and the train starts. And I've got, I'm, and that every, then the, the train is packed. So I've got, I mean, it's like, you know, I've got women pressing against me from behind and women pressing against me from each side. And of course, you know, you're that close to somebody, you can really smell them. Um, and I didn't smell anything at all. I mean, it was really kind of weird. Normally, if you're sitting, but standing beside somebody, you get some kind of an odor. Uh, but I got no odors at all. It, it was weird. I had a lady that was right in my face. Uh, and I know they were sweating. You could see the sweat in their armpits and whatnot. Um, nothing. Uh, nothing. I didn't. It's like uh, it was could have been anything or anyone or any animal for that matter. I'm getting no stimulation whatsoever. And you would and they were cute little thing. I mean, they were they were very attractive women, and uh, they were young. And I was in my 40s at the time. I was in the 90s. Yeah, I was in my 40s at the time. So potentially, I, you know, I should have been stimulated to some extent, but I got nothing out of these ladies. And so I'm, I'm thinking, oh, no, I'm going to go see my wife, and I haven't seen her in six months, and, and here I'm, I'm dead. You know, I'm, I'm, my brain is dead. I'm not responding to, uh, to stimulation. It was kind of like having a standing lap dance. It was really kind of weird because the train kept, kept bouncing up and down. You know, it's a monorail, so it kind of flips from side to side. And here I am bouncing against all these women, and they're bouncing up against me. It was really kind of weird. Anyway, so we got there, and, and I'm worried about uh, the fact that uh, that I haven't seen my wife, and, and uh, maybe it's going to be a real boring, boring time in Korea. So I got on the plane. I'm, of course, I'm worried because, uh, you know, these are... These are things you worry about when you're about to see somebody you haven't seen in six months. Anyway, uh, I got off the plane in, in Seoul and saw my wife and, uh, and everything was fine. And I didn't really think about it at the time. But uh, later on, uh, when I started reading about pheromones, uh, I realized, wait a minute, uh, there's, there may be a reason why the, the uh, Japanese women, I didn't find them stimulating, uh, uh, and that could be because they don't put off pheromones. Japanese are notorious for not putting off pheromones, and that I didn't have anything to respond to. And I, of course, I'm European, and uh, you know, I respond to, uh, I, I respond to odors because that's what I'm used to. I've been around. I've been around people that uh, that have um, these who put off pheromones, and so you know it's just kind of like this picture right here. We all do it. Well, some of us do it. Most of us do it anyway, and some of us don't. But the Japanese didn't, and and that may be one of the reasons why I didn't uh, I, I wasn't stimulated by their by the uh, by the Japanese stewardesses. As interesting as that is, or not interesting as that is. Um, uh, other times I have, uh, been someplace where somebody has, is putting off, um, you know, it's, it's not an unpleasant odor. It's just that they're putting off. One time I went into, um, Little Caesars. Uh, this was in, uh, Columbus, Mississippi. Went into Little Caesars to pick up a, 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 a pizza and, uh, and take it home to my wife, and we lived about 25, 30 minutes away from uh, from Columbus. Anyway, I went in there, and, and all of a sudden, I, I felt stimulated. It was really kind of odd, um, and the only person that was there, where well, there were a couple people there, there was somebody way in the back. I, I couldn't see him, but the the, the uh, person that was running the the front counter was this you know this uh, African American. Uh, young lady, and of course she was pretty young, but uh, evidently she was putting off pheromones, and I found it stimulating, and it stayed with the, the pizza for, you know, as as I'm driving home, about 15 minutes into the thing, I'm going, well, this is really weird, you know, I, I'm, I'm getting all this odd stimulation from from smelling this young lady. And it stayed with the pizza for about 15 minutes, and then it, it eventually it dissipated. 
but uh, it's really kind of kind of kind of different. Anyway, so I know that pheromones exist, and I can detect them. I've, I've detected them in in all three of my wives. So uh, obviously, it works as far as I'm concerned. But then again, I'm a European, um, and as I said, Africans put off pheromones as well. So you can take it for a grain of, with a grain of salt as you like. Uh, it it has. It has happened in my life, and that's all I can say. Uh, and there you go. And that's the end of the, the chapter, so I will turn this thing off right now. <clears throat> and I'll see you next week. Stay safe.